sections 5-1 through 5-4. Okay, sections 5-1 through 5-4. Quickly, 5-1. 5-1 was about work. Okay, our work theorem. And we started with the idea that work is performed on an object when there's a force applied over a distance. And that's where our equation comes from. Work equals force times distance, but times the cosine of theta. Again, 5-1 was that work is performed on an object when there's a force applied over a distance. So whenever you see a problem where there's a force, there's a force involved and you're given a distance to which that force is applied on it, think about work. Okay, think about work. We also use this in other sections. Okay, in the other sections later in the test. Now, what was theta? What was theta in these problems? And this was a little bit tricky I went over. Joyce? No, no, I'm not asking what cosine of 0 is or cosine of 180 is. I'm asking what is theta? Okay, for, for friction, but I'm saying in general. Because, for example, you, you guys all have the idea of friction. If I pull on this desk right here, okay, and I'm pulling, and it's moving this way, it's what is theta? Philip, raise your hand. The angle of the way in which it's moving, basically. The angle of the way in which the work is being done. Okay, close. You're halfway there. Help him out, Ev. Between the force and the direction. Yeah, the angle between the force applied and the direction of motion. So please write that down because not any of you answered that except for Ev there. Does anyone else have a more topic? Theta is the angle between, here you go, the angle between the force applied and the direction of motion. Okay, the, for, the angle between the force applied and the direction of motion. So, for example, if I pull on a box with a force here and it's moving to the right, then I simply go like this. I draw a little horizontal line here and that would be theta in this problem. Now, if I were to pull on that box though, same exact box I'm pulling on now, So I pull on the box with the same force, but somehow it's on like a guided track, and that track causes it to move upward. If that happens, then we need to remember to draw a vertical line in this part instead of a horizontal line to find our theta. So in this problem now, we have the same setup, but now this would be our direction of motion, so this would be theta. Again, the direction of motion is what indicates the angle theta. The force could be the same. I could be pulling on this desk at an angle and it could be moving horizontally. Or it could be pulling on this desk and maybe it's in a vertical track and it's going to only move up and down. So it depends on the motion of the object really. Okay, but again, theta is the angle between the force applied and the direction of motion. And the direction of motion. You're always going to use cosine for this. You're not going to use sine. We're not using our uh, x and y components anymore. We're just looking at the angle between the force and the direction of motion. It simplifies things for us. That's why we do this. So if theta is 180 or 4, that's our special cases, yes. When theta is 0, cosine of 0 is just 1, and the equation reduces just to just f times d. Let's write that down. So when theta is 0 degrees, the equation becomes w equals f times d. Because again, it's f times d times a positive 1 there. When theta is 180, and if you forget this, you can check on your calculator. Just type in cosine 180, you'll see it'll, get, it'll give you negative 1. It becomes work equals force times distance times negative 1. Okay, so again, we have two of these special cases that we've been identifying a few times now. Okay? Traditionally, theta is 180 when we're looking at the force applied on an object by friction. Again, let's draw our, or think about it physically. I'm moving this way. Friction is always opposite motion, so what's the angle? 180. Thus, it's the second equation here, which is why the work done by friction is indeed negative. The work done by an actual force, though, will be positive. Now, are you ever going to have an overall work net as a negative quantity? As a negative quantity? It's not possible. Can somebody explain why? So for example, right? I pull this way with a certain force, 
and friction rack reacts against me. Let's say the work done by my pull is 1,000 joules, and the work done by friction is negative 700 joules. Why will the work done by friction never be greater than negative 1,000 joules? Why is that? Because that would mean friction would be pulling back. It would be going that way if you were pulling like that. Yeah, friction would be more than your pull. And we talked about this. Remember the idea that friction can never be more than the pull force. It can be equal to it, and then it's not moving, or it's moving at a constant velocity. So if I pull with 1,000 newtons, friction can push back with 1,000 newtons, and we're still at equilibrium, and it's stationary, and that's static friction. But if I pull with something that can exceed static friction, my pull is going to have to be greater than the pull from friction. So whenever you get the work done by friction on an object, it's got to be less than the work done by the force of the person on that object. Okay? So we did an example in 5.1 where a person pulled on an object and then friction acted against it. That's a good example to look at. We also did an example where a person just pulled on an object and we said find the work done by that pull. Okay, another good example to look at. So 5.1 was all about work. 5.2. 5.2. Potential energy and the work kinetic energy theorem. So let's write these down. Kinetic energy, and the equation is 1 half mv squared, given on your test, on your formula sheet. Potential energy is mgy, and the work kinetic energy theorem says the following. So quickly, let's talk about these. When will you have kinetic energy? When there's, when there's motion. So kinetic energy has to do with motion. How about potential energy, Bobby? When there's height. When there's height. When there's height involved, there's some sort of vertical motion, right? Vertical displacement. And there's some height involved. What did the work kinetic energy theorem tell us? This is something that I think people are really having trouble on. Uh, w equals KE I. No, KE F minus KE I. Which means what? Which means that work is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic So when I do work on an object, there's going to be some change in its kinetic energy. Again, this desk is sitting still. If I pull and my energy is like a thousand joules, it will eventually start moving. And I'm causing it to go from zero velocity to maybe one meter per second. So there's some change in kinetic energy there. This formula is very similar to your conservation of energy formula. It really is. And let me quickly show that. And I realized yesterday I showed another student this and it kind of cleared up a little, mis a little bit of misconceptions. In the next section, we're going to look at a conservation of energy. You don't have to write this. Just think about this for a moment. Conservation of energy told us this. Agreed? Okay, that was our conservation of energy formula. If there's no potential energy involved, God bless you. So we're only moving horizontally. We're only moving, well, let's say only horizontally in this problem. I can drop off my PEI and PEF. Okay? Now, move, move these around and simplify. What you're going to notice is the following. Oops. If we move KEI over by subtracting it, and move Q loss over here, we end up with negative absolute value of Q loss equals KEF minus KEI. This is really the work kinetic energy theorem. That's all it is. Again, in red at the bottom here, negative Q loss, that's the work done really. That's what the work done is. And whenever we've looked at Q loss in these problems, it's been the heat loss to friction. So we're really looking at the work done by friction. So even though we use our, kinetic, our conservation of energy theorem, the work kinetic energy theorem is really the same thing, but it just doesn't involve potential energy. So if you don't want to memorize the work kinetic energy theorem, on the test, if you use the conservation of energy theorem and just drop off your PEI and PEF, you'll get the correct answer still. Okay, you will still get the correct answer. Now, there was one other type of energy we looked at besides kinetic and potential. What is it? In section 5.3, we talk about mechanical as the sum of them, but in 5.2, there was one other type of energy. It varied a little bit. 
What is it? The springs. the springs or the elastic potential energy. What was that equation? Mike? Uh, PE elastic equals one half K squared. Now, Mike, what did K represent in these problems? Um, spring constant. No, X was the spring constant. You're right. Oh, no, K was You're right. Constant. Absolutely good. So a big K means a very strong spring. A spring that would take a lot of force to compress. A small k value would be like the spring inside of your pencil or pen. Very simple to do this, isn't it? There's a spring in there, though. It's just a small k value. But if I had a giant spring from a car, try pushing down on that. It takes a lot more newtons to push it down a certain va value of meters or a certain displacement. So the k value is an indication of the strength of the spring. What about the x in this equation? What about the x in this equation? how far it can be compressed. Exactly. The distance compressed. The distance compressed or stretched. So if I start with a, strength, a spring this long, say it's two feet a spring, and I compress the spring to one and a half feet, that means the compression is a half a foot. Again, final, sorry, free minus final. Free length is two meters or two feet, either unit doesn't matter. Final length after compression is one and a half, so my x would be that half meter. Okay, so it's the change in the length of the spring. The change in the length of the spring. What is? X. Okay? Now, this formula had one thing about it that we used in section 5.3. And we always said this because it doesn't involve something that the other formulas all involve. Mass. Mass. So remember, please, with conservation of energy, which we'll look at in a moment, when you have a spring involved, masses are not going to cancel. Is that clear? When you have a spring involved, masses are not going to cancel. All right. Let's see what else. Okay, let's go to 5.3. We'll come back at the end and try and do some example problems, but I need to make sure we're clear on theory. 5.3, conservation of energy. So, uh, Reese, you, you mentioned it earlier. It was what kind of energy? Yeah, we say mechanical energy is always conserved. Okay, this is the formula you're going to be given on your formula sheet. Nothing more than this. You need to know what this means, though. You need to know what this means. Elliot, what does this mean to us? Uh, it means that the, ener the energy you have at the beginning is the same as the energy you'll have at the end. Good, and what types of energy could we have? Good, so I'll put some of potentials, showing both, good. And then, whoops, that's not final, hold on. Let's correct that, good. And then at the end, the same thing, but what did we tack on to the end in case there was Lost. friction? Lost. Yeah. Okay, please remember that when there's no friction involved, you don't need the Q loss at the end. Again, we mentioned in a moment ago, but what causes heat loss or energy loss? Reese? Friction. So we are going to remember that this is traditionally going to be the following. Either it's given, I might say, the energy loss to friction is 20 joules. Then you know what? I made it really easy. You just have to put a 20 in here. You follow me? If I say that the energy loss to friction is 20 joules, just put 20 there and that's your Q loss. But if not, you need to remember that it's really the force of friction times the distance times cosine theta. And Mike, what were you going to say? Go ahead. What were you going to say? Because you're right. What is force of friction really? No, you just said a second ago. You are about to start saying it. That was you. Sorry, Scott. I just heard it from over here. Scott, go. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, good. Mu times Fg. Okay, remember that it's really mu Fn. Force of friction is really mu Fn, but Fn and Fg are balanced when we're moving horizontally in these problems. Okay, I'm not going to give you a problem where you need to use the force of friction and it's not at some balance vertically. Okay? So either I will give you Q loss completely and I'll say it's 50 joules and you just have to plug in 50. Or 60 joules, you just plug in 60. Well, you say Q or, yeah, I'll say the thermal energy okay. loss, or the lo heat loss due to friction, or the energy loss due to friction. But the bottom here, okay, it needs to be remembered, if an object is moving horizontally across a desk or a surface, okay, this is what the equation becomes. But Fg, if we remember, is Mg. 
So it really in the end becomes this. And then cosine theta doesn't really matter because it becomes cosine of 180 if it's friction. And that's negative 1, but it's inside of an absolute value. I'll put the negative 1 there to show that it really doesn't affect this problem. Okay, please remember that. If you have friction and you're using the force of friction to calculate the Q loss, it's going to be horizontal motion only. If, if uh, FF equals mu KFG and FG equals MG, then why do you have to even write mu KFG? You don't. I was just showing the steps. Oh, okay. Absolute, Mike, abs you can go from Q loss right to this bottom line. Oh, okay. okay. okay? For Q loss? Yeah. Sure. Have, guys, if you, yeah, again, Q loss in these problems is either given as a number, 50 joules, or you have to use the force of friction so you can go right to there. Is that what, that's what you're asking, right? Yep, that's fine. Okay? And remember, people, Q loss is the same thing as work, right? F D cosine theta, that's work but it transforms itself into mu k m g d negative 1 after a little bit, bit of manipulation. But it's the same thing as work. Is there a problem you could, like, that's a two-step thing? You'd be like, what is the work done? Like, for part A, you'd be like, what is the work done? And then maybe you have to use that work done and put that number in here so, and then, and then find the rest now. Very good, Mike. You get the work in one, in like the previous one, you just yep. you lost already. See how he's already thinking about the questions in the test? That's a good thought process there. So Mike said in part A, I might say, Find the work done by friction, and you get 75 joules, or negative 75 because it's friction, right? And then in part B, you have to use conservation. You can just take the answer you got of negative 75 joules, put it inside the absolute value here, and you have your work done by friction already. So if you find the work done by friction in part A, you may have to use that in part B for Q loss. Okay, so we're seeing this connection now between work and heat loss. And that's what was important about that lab. When you guys did that lab and you saw the thermal energy increasing there, that was Q loss the whole time. But the idea was that it was still conserved. So if in the beginning of this problem, my potential and kinetic energy, let's say the sum of these was 100 joules, okay? And the work done by friction, let's say it was 25 joules. Well, it would be negative, but it's in the absolute value, right? So what would the amount of energy be left here based on conservation? Based on conservation, in the beginning, these added up to 100 joules of energy. At the end, we have some amount of energy left, but we lost 25 joules to work. How much energy is left there? 75, 75 joules. The idea of conservation still holds true. Still holds true. Okay? Energy before equals energy after. All right? Now, there are going to be a lot of problems on your test that are analogous to the skater in the skate park, or the pendulum that's swinging back and forth, or the object that's dropped from a cliff straight down. And all of those problems, I encourage you to remember the following, please. If you have an object that's being dropped from rest, and then it's going to land at the bottom of a surface, or it's going to go through a skate park ramp. So either a pendulum like this, swinging to this point right here, or a skater in a skate park going from here to here, or an object being dropped from rest and landing on the ground level. These are all ground level there, those lines. Those are all the exact same problem. There's no difference in any of these problems here. They're identical. They're analogous to one another. It's just that we model them differently with different shapes. But the equations of motion hold true for all of them. They are the same equation of motion. Can somebody tell me, before I drop the object, what energy do I have? You have potential, but no potential. So in all of these problems, it's the same. Agreed? So in the beginning, there's PEI for all of these. Now, at the bottom of the path for these two swinging, or right before it hits the ground, what type of energy do I have? Kinetic. Again, notice, they're all the same. Okay, they're all the same. So for these problems, when we solve them, we know that energy is conserved. This is the only energy we've got. So here's what our equation will become. Okay, right there in the middle of the screen. That's our governing equation for this problem. And you did this in your lab. You said the potential energy at the top equals the kinetic energy at the bottom. You wrote the equations. The equations look like the following. What's potential energy at the top going to look like? Potential energy at the top, what is the equation going to be? Mg Very good. And kinetic at the bottom? Um, one half mv, mv x 
Very good. So those are the equations that we get. And notice what cancels. The mass, leaving behind GYI equals one half VF squared. Now, I'm not going to solve this because I don't know what we're looking for, but hypothetically, if you're looking for the height of the object before it was dropped, you're looking for YI. If you're looking for the velocity at the end of the problem, you're looking for VF. So you would solve for whatever it is accordingly. Now, what about this? What if I told you the potential energy at the beginning was 50 joules? And I said, find the velocity at the bottom. And I said, find the velocity at the bottom. Okay, what would you do? Yeah, and this time, we would have to have the mass, right? Because there's no mass to cancel. So if you're given the potential energy at the top of the problem, it's equal to the kinetic at the bottom. So you can go ahead and set the 50 joules equal to kinetic at the bottom. Vice versa. If I tell you that there are 50 joules of kinetic energy when this object is launched, and I say, how high will it go? Well, then what would it look like? If I tell you there are 50 joules of energy when the object is launched from the ground, and I want to know how high up it will go. 50 equals mgyi. Yeah, the 50's now over here on the kinetic energy side, and the mgy, we'll say yf because it's the final height, it's going up, is on the left-hand side. So this one right here would be if you're given the potential energy in the beginning and you want to find something about the kinetic motion, maybe the mass or the velocity. This would be if you're given the kinetic energy of a launch on takeoff and you want to find the height it gets to. Okay? So this problem is a recurring problem. So I encourage you to be familiar with this. To be familiar with this. Okay? So if that means, you know, taking a look at your lab this weekend, which is a great way to study, it really is. Studying your lab this weekend will help you a lot. Finishing it up. Okay? Um, or looking at your example problems in class or your you know problem set questions, stuff like that to help you. I want to talk about something before we, well, let's, let's keep going, and then I'll come back to it. What is it in those problems? Seven minutes. Right? It's crazy, right? It's 32-minute period. In those, you need the mass, though, right? In that, yes, absolutely. Elliot's right. You need the mass in those problems because M doesn't cancel. Okay? All right. Let's quickly look at an example. We're not going to do numerical, but I want to talk about energy. An object is launched from a spring at an angle from a platform travels on some path, and ends up on a cliff. Okay? We'll say that the spring is compressed to ground level, so it ends up looking like this. Okay, there's the spring compressed in green. So we'll say that the spring is at ground level. Okay, still 5'3", still yeah. So here's ground level. Okay, the spring is at ground level when it's compressed. What kind of energies do we have for this kind of a problem? If we wanted to solve this using mechanical energy I equals mechanical energy F, we need to know what type of energy we have in the beginning and at the end. Okay, Smitty, give me something. Don't you have potential energy in the beginning? Why? Because the spring is holding this tiny, like it's stored up. Good, so that's potential in the spring. And then, but you're starting from already a point, and you're not starting from rest. But you are starting from rest. That's what I want to go over. Because this is the common misconception I've been seeing on your homework and notes. The spring is at rest when it's compressed. The problem begins as soon as your energy is stored. The spring energy is then converted into kinetic energy, causing it to move. Okay? So before the problem begins, it's all spring energy. You pull a pin on the spring, and then it starts to move because the spring energy is immediately converted into kinetic energy to start the problem. So beforehand, there is no kinetic. It's going to be converted, though. What about at the end? What about at the end? Bobby, you want to? We definitely have kinetic because it's going to be moving the minute before it hits the cliff. And then when it's like on the top, you have potential energy. Very good. Not spring energy, but just potential energy. So a problem like this would read the following. Here's my equation of motion. Wait, it has potential energy at the highest point? It has potential energy because it's on the cliff, right? That would be my equation of motion for this problem. So you do not ever want to memorize equations. Just know energy before equals energy after. Okay, Energy before equals energy after. This is the kind of problem 
where if there was a thermal heat loss or air resistance, I would say the object loses energy to air resistance with a value of 20 joules. So that would just tack on to the end over here. Okay? Again, if there was an object and we said that there was air resistance in this problem, so the wind was pushing back, and there was air resistance, and it caused some energy loss of 20 joules, that would just be tacked on right here at the end. That's your Q loss. Okay? It would be plus because remember, if you have all this energy in the beginning, say it's 1,000 joules, and you lose 20 joules of energy, this number is going to be 20 joules shy of what you had. So you need to take into account for it right here. It is a negative 20 F, but it's like this. Remember? Okay? So yes, it is a negative 20, but I want you to remember that it's getting tacked on the right side. So it's end up being positive. Um, X is how far it's compressed. Correct. Only the compression distance. That's it. Okay? All right, I want to talk about one more thing before I get to power. Power we're going to go through quickly, but I haven't gotten into a lot of detail. So, if I told you that an object's velocity was tripled, and I said, what happened to the kinetic energy? What could you say? An object's velocity is tripled. As a result, what happens to its kinetic energy? <laughs> so velocity is normal, V, and then afterward it's triple that. What happens to the kinetic energy of that object? Is that, is that right? What is it? Why by a factor of 9? Because it's um, V squared. Yes, look at your formula, people. Take a look. This formula would read the following for kinetic energy. Agreed? But on the right side, what would it be? It would be this. Okay, this is definitely problems on your test, folks. So, one half mv squared, one half m, quantity 3v squared. So, this quantity is what's changing the problem here. Okay, it's not just the velocity squared, it's the quantity 3v squared. So, as a result, this becomes one half m times 9v squared. We need to remember that you have to square both of these. So, what could you say? You could say that if the velocity increases, this is your statement, if the velocity increases, the kinetic energy increases by the square of the increase in velocity. If the velocity increases, then the kinetic energy increases by the square. The kinetic energy increases by the square of the velocity increase. And we're talking about factors of increase, right? Factors, not add-ins. We're not saying it's increasing by 5 joules or 5 meters per second. We're saying it's increasing by a factor of 9 or a factor of 10 or a factor of 20. So if I took the velocity and I quadrupled it, what would the kinetic energy go up by? 16. Because quadruple means you're taking the velocity and increasing it by a factor of 4. So this would become a 4V and thus this would be 16V squared. Okay, I wanted to make sure we mentioned that. Finally, let's talk quickly about power. You've got three for power. Power equals change in energy over time. Power equals work over time. Power equals force times speed. You are given these two on your formula sheet in the box. You need to remember that energy over time is the same thing as work over time. Now, the change in energy depends on the problem. If it's an elevator moving up and down, it's a change in potential energy. If it's an object sliding left to right with change in velocity, then it's a change in kinetic energy. If we have a force applied and a certain speed of the desk, then I can calculate the power generated by the object's arms or the person pushing. So depending on the problem, you need to figure out which of these you're going to use. A good example of this would be the one we did with like the horses, where we had to find the power first, then we have to find the work done. Okay? Um, let's think of what else. Yeah, it's a good example of this. What questions do you have if you want to take any quick questions? Yeah, the bell hasn't rung yet, so we're going to just keep going until it rings. Okay, one, minute. one minute. Any questions you have? But I haven't come up with something yet. Or you guys come up, they came up with it, not me. They have a class. Okay, so it could be for this test, for the next test, for now. Something like this.
So when there's an elevator problem like that, there's no change. Unless there's a change in velocity. But remember the elevator problem, David said there was a constant velocity. So although it was moving, there was no delta. So that's what you're going to ask about the test, right? That's the idea. 